High up in the mountains of southern Germany, a man built himself a home. His eagle's nest, he called it. Up here, he dreamed of ruling the world. It was a mad dream, but for a time, it seemed as though he might realize it. In the end, his dream turned into nightmare. His once proud capital became a ghost city. His people found themselves refugees in the ruins of an empire which he boasted would last a thousand years. Such was the legacy of the one-time corporal in the Kaiser's army who became dictator of Germany, Adolf Hitler. Hitler made no secret of his will to power, it was what won him the adulation of so many of his fellow countrymen. He would give them everything they wanted. He would give them glory and honor. He would make them racially pure. He would make their children masters of the world. Anyone standing in the way would be ruthlessly cut down. And yet he seemed a kindly enough man, one you could even enjoy a joke with if you knew him well enough. I don't think he was a personally brutal man, but I think he had that icy coldness that could order the deportation of the Jews to concentration camp without giving it a second thought. And I think that, incidentally, is a characteristic of a lot of great people in power. How could outsiders define this new phenomenon of German power? In Berlin, during Hitler's rise to power, was Drew Middleton, correspondent for the New York Times. Well, my personal definition would be when a man uses to the very fullest his physical, emotional, and intellectual abilities. In so doing, he affects the life of his people and the times in which he lives. In the case of Adolf Hitler, he was thinking in terms of German might making German right. And German might meant the German army, the pride of Imperial Germany, which seemed an invincible weapon in the Kaiser's hand when war began in 1914. Hitler served in that army as a company runner. His courage in the trenches won him the Iron Cross. On the battlefield, it could be proved that might makes right. True, Germany lost the war, that was because of the Republicans, the Socialists, the Jews, and the war profiteers who had combined to stab the army in the back, according to the legend which Hitler was to foster. These poisonous elements must be purged from German society, and the peace treaty they had accepted, the Treaty of Versailles, must be avenged. In the aftermath of war, riots and street brawls were commonplace. Out-of-work officers and soldiers back from the front were accustomed to violence and welcomed the chance to fight it out with supporters of the recent Bolshevik revolution in Moscow. In their hatred for the new Republic of Weimar, which replaced the Kaiser's Germany, there was nothing to choose between Hitler's National Socialists and the Communists. 
In the early 20s, Hitler and his fellow malcontents gathered in Munich. Here, Hitler's first attempt at a coup d'etat collapsed with the first round of rival fire. In prison, he brooded on the lessons of failure. Power, he realized, must be won by legal means. In prison, too, he wrote a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, a blueprint for the Nazi march to power. Few people at the time bothered to read Hitler's book, and those who did hardly took it seriously. At this stage, Hitler's posturing and the marches of the early National Socialists seemed ridiculous. Yet Hitler gave clear expression to the ideas which would later guide his actions and those of his followers. Germany must have living space, he wrote, and that living space could only be found in the East. The people must have a leader, and that leader must have the will to use power ruthlessly to purify the race and recover Germany's greatness. In Mein Kampf, Hitler also displayed his understanding of mass psychology, an understanding which amounted to genius. The propaganda techniques by which he turned his crackpot movement into the most powerful party in Germany are all laid down in Mein Kampf. hated Jews. His anti-Semitism was nurtured in the back streets of Vienna, where such views were widely held. At that time, Jewish communities existed in most of the big cities of Central Europe. To men and women who had lost their savings in the post-war inflation, or found themselves out of work in the Great Depression at the end of the 20s, these Jewish communities became a target for every kind of discontent. Hitler made the Jews a scapegoat for all Germany's misfortunes. As the power of civil law inside Germany declined, so Nazi Jew baiting grew in violence. Jews were publicly humiliated and beaten in the streets. Jewish shops were smashed. Jewish property and synagogues set on fire. Jews were easy victims of Hitler's brown-shirted thugs. But Hitler knew that he could only win his way to power through the democratic system of Weimar Germany. The state, after all, still possessed greater actual powers than he and his party did. He must obtain those powers legally. When Germany's economy suddenly collapsed in the wake of the world's slump, Hitler saw his opportunity. In a series of elections following close upon each other, he courted every kind of vote. To the employers, he promised security against Bolshevism. To the conservatives, he promised order. To the radicals, he promised social revolution. His tireless campaigning paid off. Overnight, it seemed, the number of his supporters leaped into millions. No longer a party of crackpots, National Socialism was a mass movement, equal in strength to the other powerful parties in the state. In January 1933, Hitler was appointed chancellor. His will to power had carried him to the top. Outwardly, legality was preserved, but it was the death knell of the Democratic Republic of Weimar. A huge torchlight parade by Hitler's supporters signaled his victory. No one really knew what his arrival in power would mean. His followers, of course, all looked for a share in the rewards of victory. But it would not be long before Hitler would throw his private army of brown shirts, the SA, to the wolves in order to win the confidence of the regular army. Meanwhile, the days of street brawling were over. Hitler and his party bosses were now the respectable leaders of the state. He had promised to give the nation order, an order, his kind of order, he would indeed give them, no matter what the cost. With the powers of the state in his hand, Hitler was able to exercise his skills as a propagandist on a vast scale. 
His intuition of what the German people liked to see and hear gave him a popular appeal among widely different groups of people. Giant spectacles revived memories of the glories of the past. Massive rallies excited the emotions of old and young alike. Ich verspreche. Alle Zeit meine Pflicht zu tun. In Liebe und Treue zum Führer. The young at that time vaguely recognized that back there in the past there had been something much more glorious, something much more appealing than this bourgeois Republic of Weimar. And I think there was a conscious looking back for something that was better than that person. I don't think we ought to get the idea that all the Nazis were gutter snipes either, or street brawlers. There were some very substantial people who became Nazis. With National Socialism elevated into the official creed of the German state, Hitler staged spectacles that surpassed the grandest of operas. One people, one Reich, one leader. His power was absolute. His will, unchallengeable. One secret of Hitler's hold over the German people was his skill as a speaker, in which he was aided by technical developments in radio broadcasting and sound amplification at mass rallies. The power of his oratory grew as he himself gained confidence and followers. He knew his audience, he knew exactly what chords to play to get the maximum response. He began in a very moderate tone, and then when he got on his main theme, gradually worked him up to a pitch. It's almost like a rocket going up very slowly at first, and then at the end it bursts. Through pageantry, through the rhetoric of National Socialism, through his deep understanding of mass psychology, backed where necessary by fists and jackboots, Hitler forged a power base which made him the one indispensable leader. Industry needed him for their big orders and for the freedom he gave them from union trouble. Workers needed him for their rising wages and hopes of a better future. Above all, the army needed him for the men and weapons which they were denied under the hateful Treaty of Versailles. Under the terms of the peace treaty which ended the First World War, Germany was restricted as to the armament she could manufacture and troops she could maintain. Hitler ignored the treaty. He restored conscription. And then, of course, as he rearmed, he brought back the Wehrmacht. 
with its bands, its tanks, its aircraft. And again, to an intensely militarist people, this had a great appeal. Even though at that time, comparatively, the German, the Wehrmacht was weak. It didn't look that weak to somebody who was seeing a parade of a division for the first time in his life. This looks like all the strength in the world and Germany is back on its feet again. Shock waves ran through the capitals of Europe. Some of Hitler's generals warned him against rearming. They feared retaliation from France and Britain. But the leaders of the Western democracies were unwilling to risk another war. Hitler knew their fears and played upon them. Each success gave him renewed strength. Might was proving right. In 1936, he took a further step towards destroying the Treaty of Versailles. He ordered 25,000 German troops to reoccupy the Rhineland in defiance of the peace terms. It was another gamble which some of his generals feared to take, but Hitler obeyed his own instincts. He knew France and Britain would do nothing but make noises. Once again, his will proved stronger than the irresolution of democracies fearful of another war. Hitler replaced the generals who opposed him. To maintain the momentum of power, he had to have men who would obey his every order. One moment of faltering and all would be lost. After the Rhineland came Austria, the leader's birthplace. All German-speaking people were to form part of Hitler's greater Germany. I think that Hitler was very swift to seize upon the weaknesses of the powers arrayed against him. He knew the strength of the Austrian Nazi party and the irresolution of some of the Democrats in Austria. After Austria, Hitler set his sights on Czechoslovakia, a nation created by the Treaty of Versailles, whose borders included large numbers of German-speaking people. Hitler claimed them for his Reich. Although he was momentarily checked by the diplomatic intervention of France and Britain at Munich, his drive to power soon showed that these paper agreements were worthless. While he was content for the British and French to believe that peace in our time was at hand, he was disappointed that many Germans shared this view. His appetite for conquest was only fed by the appeasement of the democracies. Not just the Sudeten Germans, but all of Czechoslovakia was next to be incorporated into Hitler's Germany. He claimed that it was his last territorial demand. But the living space which Germany needed, according to the blueprint laid down in Hitler's Mein Kampf, still lay untouched in the East. In 1939, Hitler attacked Poland. Britain and France had at last committed themselves to war, should he do so, but they were too late to deter him. He said, we are faced with the alternative to strike or to be destroyed with certainty sooner or later. No one knows how long I shall live, therefore anything is better now. The Second World War had begun. Nothing, it seemed, could stop the German armies. Before the speed and ferocity of attack known as the Blitzkrieg, one by one, the nations of Europe went under. Poland, Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg.
Then it was France's turn, and the French, one of the principal architects of the Treaty of Versailles, collapsed with a suddenness that shook the world. The British army was forced to evacuate in disarray at Dunkirk as the German Reich forged its way to the English Channel. Europe was at his feet. Hitler enjoyed his triumph to the full. Turning France's humiliation into a piece of theater, he forced her leaders to sign their country's surrender in the very railroad car in which the Germans signed their surrender in 1918. Here we see Hitler at the apex of his power. He has defeated the French, his greatest enemy. He has driven the British army into the sea. He has proven to himself and to his people that German might makes German right. He has reversed the decision of 1918 and he has eliminated the Versailles Treaty. Hitler's revenge was complete, his power apparently unassailable. But his dream, seemingly within his grasp, would turn to nightmare. 